Sam Hatcher Falcons, and I'm a program manager at the Council for Disabled Children. I work on the RISE partnership um, through the Send Systems Improvement Team. Before this, I trained originally as a primary school mainstream primary school teacher, Key Stage One uh, was my was my bag, and then worked in various Send settings, and then managed a supported internship in London down in the southwest. Hi, I'm Lucy Adams. Um, I've worked in education and health um, over several years, supporting children and young people um, with SEND. Um, I most, most recently did a PhD um, in improving the accessibility of mental health care um, for autistic individuals. Um, and I've also worked in a CAM supporting autism assessments. Um, Lovely. So just a couple of other quick house rules as we get started. We I'm really glad to see that we've already got some new conversation going. Um, we do just ask that you respect other people's opinions. You know, we might not always agree, but we want to have this as a, as a respectful and useful conversation. Um, we're also not seeking perfect answers. We're not going to solve all the challenges of SEND systems uh, in the next 35 minutes or so. We'd be very impressed if we did, um, but probably the right group of people to do so if we had that option. Um, as we're going through, we will talk about different things and what we'd ask is if you've got a question that you want answered or you want to discuss at the end, we've got a bit of time for that, please put it into the chat and we'll come back to it. We will be keeping an eye on the chat though and if there's something where I've misspoken or, or something's not very clear, please feel free to sort of put a hand up and we can address that straight away. Um, in part, as me and Lisa were talking about before, uh, we, we came onto this call, uh, it's easy to lose our train of thought. Um, and on that same note, um, I have ADHD and can speak a little bit quickly, so please feel free to put a hand up if I'm doing that. And Lucy will, you know, kick me under the table if if I get too quick as well. I'm sure. Um, excellent. So today we're going to go through uh, a few aspects. We'll talk a little bit about the Ofsted CQC framework, the new framework. Um, thankfully, and and hopefully they actually talked about it themselves earlier as well. Um, we'll talk about the CDC thematic analysis approach and, and how we've gone about this. Um, some common strength and some common areas for improvement. You know, we want to look at the good practice. We want to be upfront about areas that struggle, about areas for improvement in different uh, locations as well. And that will include good practice examples and guidance. Um, with those good practice examples and guidance, um, some aspects will, will be sending out the slides. So all of these resources will be available and we'll be including lots of the um, resource links and things in the chat as we go through. Um, we'll end with a quick look at what comes next and, and where improvement boards go from here. So some of you may have been at Christine, uh, Dame Christine Lenahan's um, talk on exactly that uh, separately just before this. Um, and we'll have a bit of time for discussion right at the end. Um, it, we'll give it just one minute and in the chat, I'd be really interested to see um, in a, a word or a short sentence, what strategic challenges you've seen or experienced in your area? Um, as I say, we'll just give it one minute to, to keep things moving along, but um, yeah, anything that immediately springs to mind would be great to hear. Partnerships. Thank you, Rachel. That's um, a really good one. And uh, you might be unsurprised to find out that that, oh, and a second one on partnerships, um, that will that will come up throughout the uh, day. Um, yeah. Chris, Christopher, sorry, data. Um, we'll be making uh, a comment on that as well. Yep, thanks, Luna. Um, bringing people along. I really like the way you phrased that, Sam. Thank you so much. I think, um, yeah, bringing people along on the journey is, is really key. Um, restructures, yep, again. Demand, absolutely. I think um, we're seeing, seeing a lot of that. I think what's quite heartening with all these comments that we're getting in here is. Um, maybe presupposing a little bit, but I think it aligns with some of the things we'll talk about um, and we'll come back to some of these themes a bit later on. The other thing to mention is we do, uh, as people and professionals and parents and carers work in the SEND system, Special Educational Needs and Disabilities, we're a little bit prone to using acronyms and I'm the first to put my hands up and say that we, we do that. We're going to put in the chat some of these acronyms that we may use and if we do and or I completely get into the habit, please feel free to, to put your hand up or just shout out that on that one, happy to be interrupted on that. But Lucy's going to put some of these common ones that we might have in there. Um, excellent, I'll hand over to, oh no, I won't hand over to Lucy just yet. Um, but looking at the new framework, and as we start to get into the, the sort of me the issue, um, the new Ofsted CQC framework came in from the 1st January, 2023. So just over a year ago, and it felt like a really good time to look back, back on that year and, and how that's all gone. Previously, the inspections were focused on 
how local authorities were meeting their requirements in the SEM code of practice. Um, and the new framework, and we put this at the top because I think it is one of the more important aspects, is focused on the experiences and outcomes for children and young people. And as you read the report, that sort of framing of it is really important. It talks about what's it like to be a child or young person with SEND in X local area. It brought in a cycle of inspections for at least every five years, um, which is, you know, a big ask, but it's it's about making that a process rather than a one time standalone thing um, and focus mainly on education and health, but including social care inspectors again, because we need to start uh, viewing the system as, as more joined up and, and making sure, as has been mentioned with some of these strategic challenges about having those good partnerships and multi agency working. And the other really key aspect, hopefully you all managed to catch what Martin and that uh, were saying about alternative provision from all of academies, because they're absolutely fantastic. Um, but thinking about alternative provision and what we won't talk about today, because it came out just a week ago, um, and that was around the time we finished the presentation, is the thematic visits that Austin CQC have done on alternative provision. I think they they mentioned some of the findings they had there. The report is really interesting. I'd really recommend reading it. Um, but we, as I say, we won't get too much into that thematic visit um, or the next one on PFA today. Finally, the other th new aspect of the framework is around the outcomes. And there are three new clear outcomes and criteria for each. As we go through, um, Lucy will tell you a little bit more about them, but we'll refer to them in the language of typically positive, inconsistent, or sort of widespread failings. But I'll hand over to Lucy now to say a bit more and more. Yeah, so these um, outcomes, as mentioned earlier, provide an independent external evaluation of the effectiveness of the local area's partnership arrangements for children and young people with SEND, <clears throat> and they all focus on the experiences and outcomes of, for children and young people with SEND. And where appropriate, it's recommended um, what the local area partnership should do to improve their arrangements. So the top outcome being positive experiences and outcomes, um, and that's it typically leading um, to those experiences and outcomes for children and people with SEND, um, and that the local area partnership is taking action where improvements are needed, which is why um, this outcome can be achieved even if there are issues. Um, and then there are inconsistent experiences and outcome, outcomes, again, referring to children and young people with SEND, um, and that the local area partnership must work jointly to make improvements. And finally, there's widespread and or systemic failings that lead to significant concerns surrounding experiences and outcomes as before, which the partnership must address urgently. Um, and then there's a full inspection that will follow um, in five years for positive experiences and outcomes and then within three years for the other two um, and a monitoring inspection will follow within approximately 18 months of widespread and systemic failings. And the evaluation criteria um, are on the slide, um, but for positive experiences and outcomes, um, children and young people are typically achieving strong outcomes and experiences of their education, health and care are typically positive um, and again taking action um, and there are no areas of priority action. For inconsistent experiences and outcomes, either of the points <clears throat> in relation to experiences and outcomes of children and young people in the above cell are not met. Um, and there are no areas for priority action. Um, and for widespread systemic failings, um, there is one or more areas for priority action and with significant concerns, as mentioned previously. In terms of what the outcomes have been for local authorities, they've approximately um, been evenly distributed um, amongst the outcomes. And so, and now we'll move on to our analysis. So it all starts with the What Works and Send programme, which generates evidence on what works and send and what doesn't work um, in terms of service improvement and practice models. And it's a partnership led by CDC. Um, the Effective Practice Evidence Framework is an output of that programme, um, which is all about um, robust, it's all about capturing, validating and sharing examples of effective local SEND systems in England in a robust way. And from that, six themes were identified, um, which we uh, structure our analysis by. So co-production, shared vision and purpose, stable and knowledgeable leadership, a focus on the quality delivery of the essentials, 
an organised, skilled and supported workforce and information and communication. Sorry, my voice is going. Um, but for each of those themes, um, we identify strengths and areas for improvement. And they broadly overlap with the evaluation criteria that I've just mentioned. So in terms of the themes, um, co-production, of course, is all about using lived experience to shape system and service design. Um, shared vision is about a shared ethos um, with shared responsibility and accountability. Uh, stable and knowledgeable leadership is about collective buy-in from leaders underpinned by robust governance structures and communication. Um, and there's a readiness to implement any changes in strategy and direction. Quality, of deliver quality delivery of the essentials is about understanding the statutory framework um, across all partners. Um, and ensuring that people with SEND have access to practice and provisions. Um, and a well-organised, skilled and supported workforce is about a workforce that's organised in such a way that it has sufficient capacity to get the support that children and young people need. Um, and information and communication is about effective information sharing across partners and agencies um, with children and young people as well. So now we'll move on to the common strengths and areas for improvement for each of those themes that I've just described um, and we'll include some good practice examples and guidance. So firstly, um, ideally co-production is embedded across all levels. Um, it means that voices of lived experience are, held, are heard in long term plans um, and it's impactful and meaningful. So the common strengths um, that we found across inspection reports include that views of lived experience were sought, um, services and strategies were co-produced, and the and parent care forums tend to be involved in co-production, including at strategic level, and children and young people's views being heard by professionals in particular. Common areas of improvement include voices of lived experience being unheard or unimpactful and there being an absence or reduced strategic level co-production. So the most common area for improvement was strategic level co-production with children and young people. Um, so that has an example of an inspection extract um, that fits in with that theme. Um, and as I mentioned, in contrast, parent care forums do tend to be involved at this level. And on this slide, I've got some CDC resources um, and a SEND strategy co-produced for children and young people with SEND. Um, and a figure from NHS England that um, distinguishes between co-production and informing um, people with lived experience, consulting them, engaging them so and hearing their views and co-design. So with co-production being about an equal partnership, um, with children and young people from the start to, fin to the finish throughout um, and then ensuring that those views impact um, what's done through evaluation and monitoring and ideally um, through an established group though not always um, and recognising that of course expertise through lived experience um, is crucial um, but of course the ideal situation of embedding and developing co-production can of course take time um, and when I'm referring to strategic level co-production, um, it impacts things such as policies, strategies, guidance, good practice and quality improvement on a high level. Um, and things that facilitate co-production include a culture of openness and of course clear communication in plain English. Um, so we'll talk through, as I say, some of these sort of good practice examples um, and general good practice that we pulled out or general challenges. So when it came to shared vision and purpose, our theme two, um, this word is really key, but ambition and effective communication were embedded. So that was across local area leaders and it wasn't just cursory or lip service paid to those aspects. Um, children and young people were at the heart of decision making and that was, uh, you know, clear across those that got typically positive areas, uh, positive outcomes, I should say. Um, and, you know, we saw that uh, also across some um, analysis we did recently of integrated care strategies um, and not recognising children and young people as their own group and the difference that it makes to do so. 
Um, and we've mentioned PFA, which might seem a bit around sort of quality of delivery of the essentials, but it's worth mentioning at this point that a lot of these will cross over. There is, you know, me and Lucy have had many conversations where we've gone, oh, does this fit more in this theme or this theme, or does it go in both? And and we're not saying that we're um, the final word and, and there will be different opinion. But we mentioned PFA here because and therefore transitions, because when PFA, for instance, is embedded effectively from year nine or even earlier to, to think about that um, transition, especially at the age of 25, which to so many children and young people and their families can be a bit of a cliff edge, um, having that embedded and, and having everyone bought into the ideas of let's make this work for the child and young person's whole life, not just for that time that we interact with them. Um, we saw that the one of the common areas for improvement was reliance on professionals to advocate for individual children and young people. So having one teacher, therapist, social worker who really championed that cause, because the obvious questions are, OK, what if that person doesn't exist for someone? What if uh, that person moves on into a different job? What happens to the people that they've been championing? Um, so we want to make sure that it's effective across the whole system and that vision works across everyone. On the flip side, um, we had a really nice example from Rutland looking at their SEND promise, as they call it, um, where they're ambitious for children and young people with SEND, and that was a, a typical sentence across typically positive outcomes. Um, but Rutland's example here clearly lays out their use of the graduated approach and the difference in support for students with SEND um, who have EHCPs and the fact that they might go different down different pathways. When it comes to stable and knowledgeable leadership, um, and we'll come back to that word stable quite a few times. I'll, I'll say that now. Um, you'll potentially not be surprised given how many people mentioned um, earlier comments on data, but data and reporting, reporting mechanisms were really important. So the more effectively the areas, for instance, had data dashboards that leaders could get a strategic oversight of what was going on, really essential. That information being used in commissioning and that use of data to, to sort of target areas and, and we run various workshops um, through the RISE program on that exact issue and, and challenge is um, making sure that we're we're not just measuring things but measuring things to then be able to target support. Stability of leadership you know consistently we saw that leadership was embedded and stable in reports and where that wasn't the case it was more of a challenge and again partnerships and accountability I think link very clearly the move from uh, clinical commissioning groups to, um, and someone mentioned this explicitly, ICBs, integrated care boards, and people not necessarily always knowing who's responsible for what, and we need to make sure that that's really clear and, and that will come back later. We mentioned insufficient use of data, um, as it says there, should act with urgency to accelerate their, accelerate their data dashboard work so they have a shared, accurate understanding of the exact provision for send. And we see quite regularly, you know, when we bring people into a room to talk about data dashboards, so I'm going, oh, you know what would make my life a lot easier is this particular set of data. And it turns out that there is someone who has that, but they just didn't know that. So again, it links back to that partnerships and across themes. Um, we don't like to just be doom and gloom and, and we think we've got some really useful resources here so around um, joint strategic needs assessments and um, getting qualitative data um, and because we're we would like to be really helpful um, a data dashboard template for power bi which kind of brings together some of those key themes um, straight away um, on stable and knowledgeable leadership as well we did talk about strategic oversight um, you know, here in one example, it was around work streams having equal clarity and how they're mapped out and organised so that they've got that understanding of where they fit into that bigger picture. You know, if we're working towards strategic outcomes and saying this is what we want for our children, and young people, um, it doesn't matter how many people with, you know, all the good intent and all the skills, if they're not joined it up and, and everyone knows whether they fit into it, then you're not set, giving them the conditions to succeed. Oh, no, that was the uh, wrong one. Um, on the other side, on, on a good practice example of strategic oversight was Hartlepool. Um, and you know, leaders have developed systems to ensure they have an accurate picture of the needs of children, and young people with education, health and care plans. You absolutely could come back to that and say, OK, well, what about the children without EHC plans who receive SEND support? But, you know, again, it's improving one area and to then be able to focus on another is really key. And as it says there at the end, leaders have strengthened governance arrangements, which has improved the strategic oversight of developments. And again, having those Good uh, governance structures allows for better knowledge and um, able ability to then get into deep dives and things like that. Uh, quality delivery of the essentials, and again, where we will acknowledge that these themes all overlap and overlink, overlink, link up. Um, 
some of the, a lot of this could be described as quality delivery of the essentials, but it also links in other ways. So you won't be, I imagine, surprised to hear timely assessments and waiting times right at the top there. We know that that's national challenges, and we're, we're certainly when we're going through this, we're not trying to challenge anyone on their particular performance, but just acknowledge that that is a, a national picture. And in at least one um, report was picked up as a, a factor. Um, the EHCP and annual review process, and actually, I think probably going back, tying that in with timely assessments and early identification of need and the link to alternative provision. Lots of children and young people who end up at alternative provision, if they don't have any EHCP, are assessed and found to have some form of SEND, um, I would say, reasonably confident saying the vast majority um, once they hit that stage or in the process. Um, Multi-agency work and communication, again, really good to see that kind of coming up as something that lots of people are identifying. But when that is embedded well, uh, it can make a really, really big difference. Um, we know that waiting times can can be really challenging, but and we'll come on to that in just a moment. But um, also using established systems, so like the dynamic support register to really have a good idea of um, what it is that, you know, the needs that are going to be identified. Um, we wanted to pick up on assessment waiting times because I think it's good to contrast the, the good and the less good. Um, in particular, it was around the neurodevelopmental pathway, speech and language therapy, and CAMS, child and adolescent mental health services. Um, and again, pretty consistently across uh, inconsistent or widespread failing outcomes was children and young people waiting too long. And where I think we can contrast this and it's useful to do so is we know that children and young people arguably are waiting too long in lots of areas. That's you know, again, not passing judgment, that's just um, an identification of the national picture. It's about how that is tackled within local areas. So Greenwich is a really nice example here in two ways. One, they've created a single point of access for either ASD, um, aut autistic spectrum disorder, or ADHD diagnoses, um, or for when both diagnoses are needed. So they're not sort of trying to go off into um, pursue two different pathways and two different professionals and things like that. Um, but they've also got a wide range of services available for children and young people while they wait, offering direct interventions and useful support. So if there's not a way to immediately reduce waiting times, it's about you know signposting to other resources, other services that may be able to support. Um, and as it says there at the end, looking at innovative ways to identify needs and provide support earlier. Um, we can't magically make a, a load more speech and language therapists appear but it's about what we can do to support people whilst they're waiting for that support um we looked at the the later annual review process and again it's it will link up to what we say about ehcps in a moment but making sure the appropriate professionals are there and that speaks to wider workforce challenges um but in local areas ensuring that the the right people are in the room at the right time um, again, I think it, it really links to that transitions we were talking about earlier when it comes to annual reviews in particular. So we wanted to mention, um, again, some resources we've got. Um, I think I may have spied something in the chat around PFA, and um, if we've got some time at the end, I'll talk about some options there. Um, but there's some immediate sort of quick wins in terms of the high quality annual review training is, a, is an e-learning that I'd really recommend um, if you get a chance or want to share that with your colleagues. Um, and looking at an organised, skilled and supported workforce, uh, you know, it's about having knowledge of children, and young people and their needs, whether that's the um, EHCP coordinator or officer in the local area, right up to, to leaders of the um, local authority or ICB. Um, it's about getting timely identification of need and, and if something is suspected as a, as a need, getting support in there as a waiting well, as it says in the bottom, and multi-agency communication really makes a difference to allow for a well-organised and supported workforce. Um, similar to the annual reviews, it's about getting consistently good quality EHCP con contributions um, and having people able to attend those meetings. Um, we wanted to mention, though, in Hartlepool, uh, we've mentioned a couple of times actually, but one really nice uh, example that we pulled out was the tell it once approach. So where possible practitioners were consolidating appointments so that children, young people and their families weren't having to sort of tell or and I, I will use this word sell their story and, and get people to understand their needs um, as many times and everyone was working off the same information which I think helps tackle that sense of sort of being passed around the system and, and ties in with where Greenwich has that one access point for ASD or ADHD assessments or, or um, support and finally we wanted to mention information and communication as one of our themes so 
I've used the phrase a lot, but multi-agency communication can make all the difference. If everyone's joined up and working well across systems, it means that children and young people are better supported. It can also mitigate some challenges, so from leadership to families. Um, it Again, we can't always change things straight away. We know that you know the um, change program is going to take time, for instance, and can lead to some really good changes, but it will. It needs updates and people need to know what's going on for the longer term to, to feel sort of supported on the journey. Um, as I mentioned, leadership with families and, and this one I think is one that might be familiar with some people is a local offer that looks really good. It's a lovely shiny website, but it doesn't give them up to date information or there's not the sort of resources put into it. Um, contrasted with uh, the Middlesbrough Send Local Offer, which we've got the link in there. Um, I believe Lucy's going to put into the chat as well, but um, where they use website, the newsletter, they've got an active parent and carer forum that can help disseminate that information. And then speaking of dissemination of information, um, having good send -yes services and they're really valued in, for instance, Brighton um, and really getting that communication out and, and helping everyone across the local area understand what's going on. So those are our themes. I won't talk on this slide because I want to bring in everyone else and we're, we're running a little bit short on time. But um, before we move on to a bit of a discussion, there's two things I want to touch on. Um, some of you, as I say, may have seen uh, Dame Lenahan's uh, workshop on, on improvement boards and she in response to, to this workshop was saying um, it is a learning process. There's not necessarily a good practice example. I think there might be some more of that coming in the future, but there's currently five improvement boards and at least two more that we set up. And for how the key issues work, can we measure impact and understand goals? What do Ofsted and CEC see as success? What do the DFE and NHS regional staff see as success? And then, of course, what do the parents and children think is success? And that's probably the most important bit there. And for how the key emerging areas were effective work with parents and carers, understanding the role of schools, and key was understanding effective partnerships and delivery between the local authority and uh, integrated care boards, which again, I think is um, nice to see lined up with a few sort of expectations. Not a problem at all. Thank you for letting us know. Um, before we completely move on to a discussion, I just wanted to highlight that through the Rise, Rise program, we've got some free trainings coming up. Uh, if you're not sick of my voice, I'm doing some on the Equality Act next week. Uh, but please do feel free to sign up when we send these out. And then I will hopefully stop talking a little bit. Um, but I wanted to hand over to everyone else. And, and please feel free to put your hand up or put something into the chat on these three questions. So first and foremost, do these findings align with your expectations of, of what you would have thought? Are there any findings that have surprised you? And I think this one's really crucial and, and nice to hear and we'd also be interested in following up. But are there examples of things that have helped your area with these themes? So as a reminder, that's uh, co-production, vision and purpose, stable and knowledgeable leadership, quality delivery of the essentials and uh, organised, skilled and supported workforce, information and communication. Um, but I'll, I'll open up the floor. As I say, please put, feel free to put your hand up or to um, say it uh, in the chat as well. Out for any of those questions. Super. Una, if you'd like to come in, please correct me if I've pronounced that correct, incorrect. No, no, you got that right. Thanks, thanks, Sam. Yeah. It's actually just a quick question. I just want for, for, um, to clarify something, really. So, when we talk, or you talked earlier about the improvement boards, mm -hmm. are they being set up just for the local authorities that have failed their inspections, or, or are they improvement, like kind of general improvement boards that are? that are going to, we're all going to kind of benefit from the findings of? So they are, that's a really good question, thank you, and I should have clarified that, um, is they are set up for those areas that have an inspection report of widespread failings, so they're not for everyone. Mm -hmm. I think we spoke in the last session about there's benefits of, you know, you've got to find some benefits in, in getting an inspection result like that, and sometimes it puts the priority on, so I think there will be useful learning that comes out of them. Um, and again, I think we're, we're, uh, Dame Lenahan is going to be delivering and leading a couple of those and bringing that back into the work that we do to try and share that information. Yeah, so that ultimately we'll all benefit from those from those kind of findings, right? Okay. Yeah. Thank I you. would say, you know, when we do the next national event, I'm hoping that we can bring Christine into doing another one uh, and talk about where we are, you know, six months down the line from here. Okay, thanks for clarifying that, Sam. Oh, was there a question in the chat? Sorry. Excellent. Uh, around PFA, thank you for reminding me. Um, recommendations or guidance that you can signpost about timing and ways to introduce PFA. Um, 
I think, so I'll read out the rest of this, I think it's a really, really useful point. Um, I feel that there is a limited advice, there is limited advice for health staff in particular to plan and introduce PFA very early on and the inconsistencies with the offer from different services, such as different ages, uh, for transition to adult services present a real challenge. I really, really echo that from my experience. Jennifer, I think I can see on there, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, thank you. It was just, um, I've seen the the link that's been attached as well and I have seen some various different guidance it was more sort of if you've got any good examples that you'd be happy to share with us in future because I think there are lots of guidance and recommendations but I think really it wasn't worded correctly in my question but what I'd like to know is how people have put that into practice in a really sort of good way um, because we often find and I, I feel as a parent carer as well that often the early years are a really good time to start thinking about transitions but parent carers aren't always ready Health professionals aren't always aware that actually they need to be talking about preparation for adulthood at such an early stage um, and it doesn't need to be adulthood as, as such, it's more preparation for the next stage and the next transition. So I just wondered if there was, I know there's various different things online, but but if there's sort of a recommendation that you've got within the CDC about almost like a journey of what that should look like for a young person with obviously the exception that it's individualised. So it's, it's a really big question, sorry. So, um, there's... Well, I'll go off on a tangent after I answer your question, if that's right, because you raised a point I should have mentioned. Um, in terms of PFA, so as part of the RISE partnership, one of the partners is the NDTI, and I, for a moment, I've forgotten the acronym, pardon me, um, but they do some absolutely excellent work, and I definitely recommend um, looking at some of the work that they did, National Development Team for Inclusion. Um, I think we can definitely share the link to sort of their general page, but they, alongside us, do some e-learning. We're actually in development of an e-learning. I don't think I'm speaking out of turn to say that we've got one coming out soon on exactly this. Um, and I believe we've got one around preparing for adulthood and EHCPs and some case studies. So, um, Lucy, if you've got that available, do you mind sharing that in the chat? I've already shared Oh, it, fantastic. Yeah. yeah, so some of that's in the chat. Yeah. But also feel free to follow up with me, um, Jennifer, and I can try and get some more specific examples that aren't just off the top of my head. The thing I wanted to mention as well is you mentioned the great work in early years, and I don't think I said it throughout this one. One area that did come out quite consistently as being really good, strong practice for early identification of need was early years settings, and, and they've done some incredible work, and I think it's worth acknowledging that. Um, super. Anyone else? I think I can see something else in the chat. So I'm sure. Oh, that's really interesting. Thank you. Uh, Bridget, I'll read that out if that's right. So some of our young people don't like the use of um, adulthood, so we're challenging it to preparation for the future. Absolutely. I think it's um, it's about what works in, in your local area. Me and Lucy were talking about, you know, how that language changes in, in all these sort of um, arenas over the years and goes up or down or changes left and right, you know, as it was. Una, just to check, your hand is up. I wasn't sure if you just hadn't put that down or... Oh, sorry, yeah, I'll put that down. That's all right. <laughs> no, you're welcome to come back in if you'd like, and, and then, as I say, open up the floor to, to anyone else who'd like to put, contribute. And we've got some general resources as well. We do, actually. We'll, yeah, we'll share that um, slide there. I think as well it's worth on the general resources mentioning, you know, in some of the slides we've got the data dashboard template and things like that, but when I started teach training, one of the things that was sort of drilled into us right from the word go was you don't need to reinvent the wheel um, right from the beginning. And for some of these things, you know, we've seen some really great data dashboards. I won't mention specific areas um, and I would love to take them and, you know, spend weeks looking at that. Um, but if you are looking for a place to start, then there is those templates available through CDC. Um, or if you've got other good practice that you'd like to share with us, we'd always be interested in seeing that as well. So um, I'll go back to these. Also, the yep. oh sorry, I've oh no, I've seen your hand up again. There we go. Uh, sorry, I was just going to come in there and just on on the on the data. I think one of the challenges that we have is um is in collating the health data because obviously the ICB they have more than obviously one local authority and such and we do um that they're, that they're working to so it's how it's it's extrapolating the certain specific data mm. and then making sure that it is it's in the for same format as the rest of the data so because some some data is obviously quarterly some is annual some you know in advance some you know uh, in all different kind of formats it's just trying to get it all on the same format um and and drill down to sort of something specific and 
so there's so many different and then that's not even kind of my specific area so I'm trying to ask somebody else to do that as well so it's trying to coordinate all of that so that that is then in one one space so it's, it's quite a big ask to ask somebody else to do that <laughs> that's what we need as part of the inspection so it's and then it's kind of like well what do other local authorities do then you sort of kind of you know start wondering whether you're kind of being too kind of detailed or whether you're yeah. being too much do you know what I mean so it's a bit of a and absolutely we we you know when we go in and we work on um on the ride program with uh one aspect of it we do these sort of bespoke support i think amanda mentioned right at the beginning um but the thing when it comes to strategic outcomes and, and trying to get that sort of you don't want to, like you say you can't always be too detailed when you're working from a strategic leadership point of view so identifying what those key data indicators are going to be and then as you say getting them into the same format so everyone's pulling it across um and it's where, you know, if we had endless money and budget and people, it'd be great because you'd have a data team that can do exactly that. Yeah. Uh, but that's not always available. And so it's trying to find ways to, to work around that. Um, on that, and it's a bit of a niche point, but one thing we've seen quite a few times and we've tried to mitigate is data sharing agreements and GDPR, for instance, um, sometimes becomes an issue. So we've got on that same page, I think, some data sharing agreements and to try and get it so that people feel more comfortable, uh, confident and comfortable sharing that information across. Um, Again, if you're if if that's if you're like me and that's what gets you you know really excited this morning, then um, I definitely recommend that page and, and always have to chat through a little bit more. Um, Grant, we are technically at the end, so I will go on to our final slide, our evaluation form. Um, it I believe is evaluating the whole day, um, and Lucy has very kindly put the link in the chat as well. But we really appreciate any feedback, any comments um, or observations. And we just want to say thank you so much uh, for joining us today. And, and we hope you found this useful. And it's really great to hear from somebody about what's going on in your areas. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be on for a moment or two longer. So if you've got any follow up questions, um, Helen, please do jump in. Or was that meant to be a, an applause? Or yeah, it was meant to be an applause. <laughs> Sorry. I'll take it. It's fine. Super.